Good evening. Good evening and welcome. I'm Jennifer Schubert Aiken. I'm the CEO and co-founder of the Steamboat Institute. It's a pleasure to welcome all of you to the kickoff of the fall edition of our Campus Liberty Tour. Over the next six weeks, we will visit six campuses in six states with six different debates. I can't think of a better place to start than right here in this beautiful debate chamber at, here at Old Parkland in Dallas. Uh, thank you. In addition to all of you here with us tonight in Dallas, I would also like to welcome our virtual audience, which includes viewers from Georgetown, Texas, Denver, Colorado, Cornell University in Ithaca, New York, and MIT in Cambridge, Massachusetts, as well as many other individuals all over the country. As a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization, Steamboat Institute relies on the support of many generous individuals and foundations to bring programs such as tonight's debate to audiences across the country. I would like to especially thank the Adolph Coors Foundation for their support of our Campus Liberty Tour debates nationwide, and also a very special thank you to the Sumner's Foundation here in Dallas for funding, pr providing funding for tonight's debate. And now, let's take a few moments to learn more about tonight's sponsor, the Sumner's Foundation, with this brief video. We come from different walks of life and follow different paths, pursue different professions, practice different traditions. We are different. Yet one thing unites us. We are Americans. We are the Sumner's Foundation. Developing a network of thought leaders around the founding ideals of self-governance by funding scholarships and investing in programs that educate and engage Americans. The Sumner's Foundation, on the job since 1949. We're also happy to have with us tonight several of the Sumner Scholars who are college students here in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, as well as Eileen Resnick, the Executive Director of the Sumner's Foundation. So thank you again to the Sumner's Foundation. One of the most consequential issues of our time is the relationship between the United States and China. In recent years, concerns have been raised over Confucius Institutes on American college campuses and Chinese funding of American colleges and universities. Tonight's program will examine this issue with a debate on the following resolution. Be it resolved, the risks of academic engagement with China outweigh the benefits and the US government and universities must take action to address this risk. We invite all of our audience members to respond with your view on this resolution, agree, disagree, or undecided before the debate begins using the QR code provided. We will then ask your opinion again after the debate is over to see if your opinions have changed. Now, in, for those of you here in the debate chamber in Dallas, there is no cell signal in here tonight. Um, so it's because we are uh, below ground, um, so there is a Wi-Fi card with the, the Wi-Fi password on it that was uh, at your, your place when you sat down. So be sure to um, use the Wi-Fi so that you can vote. And for our virtual audience, of course, you should have received a link also so that you can vote in this poll. You can see the results being displayed in real time. And once again, we will show that to you again at the end when you will have a chance to vote after the debate is over. To set the stage for tonight's debate, we are honored to have with us America's 70th Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo. Secretary Pompeo served as Secretary of State under President Donald Trump, and prior to that, he served as President Trump's CIA director. Before his time in the executive branch, he was elected to four terms in Congress, representing the 4th District of Kansas. Before his time in government, he founded an aircraft part manufacturing firm, Thayer Aerospace, in Wichita, Kansas. He has a degree from Harvard Law School, served as a U.S. Army tank platoon leader, retired from active duty military service with the rank of captain, 
and graduated first in his class at West Point. His career has seen him lead men in West Germany during the Cold War, lead a machine shop floor in Kansas, and most recently lead the CIA and the Department of State, a time he details in his new book, Never Give an Inch, Fighting for the America I Love, which was released in January and is a New York Times bestseller. That's quite a journey, and we can't wait to hear what you have in store next. Welcome, Mr. Secretary. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you. Oh, you okay? All right. Good evening. How are you all? Good. It's great to be with you. Uh, thanks for the kind introduction. I can't wait to see what's next either uh, for our country and, and for my family as well. Um, tonight I have the incredible opportunity to be with the Steamboat Institute, some great people and some great young people as well. Um, to set the stage for what will be a lively discussion, I know each of the two professors uh, and I know they have different views and you will get to hear each of them and you'll get to hear them in a way that is civil and important and decent and fact-based and I think that is exactly what America needs. Uh, my task tonight isn't to tell you what I think about this but rather to set the, the background, the context against which the debate which will take place this evening uh, plays out. Dr. Yu and Dr. Wang, they are well equipped to share with you their views. You couldn't find two better people. They both love America. Their views are informed by their trust in the principles of democracy and freedom. And I want to thank each of them for the discussion that I know we will have tonight. I want to set the stage by talking about why it matters, why it is that this topic that they'll discuss tonight is important to each of you and to your families and to your community. This idea of Confucius Institutes in our institutions of higher learning was something that was on the agenda in the Trump administration. It had been around for a while. Uh, we also know that academic freedom matters an awful lot. We want to bring a wide range of views to our campuses. We have to get that right also. But to begin to frame the discussion, I always note that it is not the Chinese people that challenge the United States of America. It is a political party. It is the Chinese Communist Party, and that distinction matters an awful lot. I'll leave it to these two accomplished gentlemen to talk about the Confucius Institutes, but by way of background, we've seen what's happening inside of our country. I think of it as the Chinese Communist Party inside the gates here in America. We talk about Taiwan, we talk about problems in the South Pacific, but make no mistake, it is all around us. A Chinese spy balloon traversed our country for five days. I was asked the other day, would that have happened in the Trump administration? And I said, perhaps, but I would have been the former Secretary of State. Uh, we've watched Chinese espionage operations, influence operations in New York City, Los Angeles, and here in this state of Texas, it was so bad that I directed the closure of the Chinese consulate in Houston, Texas. They are not here because they love us. They are not here to make America great. They are here on a mission. There is no doubt about it. Many of you have probably read about the ambitions that the Chinese have to purchase real estate in and around American military institutions. And of course, we all know that the Chinese Communist Party built a good deal of its wealth on the back of American workers stealing certainly billions, I can prove tens of billions, but perhaps hundreds of billions of dollars worth of American hard-earned intellectual property. Ideas, products, trademarks, things that we created were stolen, built in China, and then flooded our markets cheaply, hurting Americans again. So this challenge is certainly real. The responses, of course, require more than just America. I think about so many families that suffered over these past years from a virus that came to the United States from a laboratory operated inside of China. They, uh, they, uh, they knew what they were building there. They came to know by the end of 2020 that they had a relatively contagious, relatively lethal virus on their hands. 
and they chose something that is fundamentally different than any other nation would have chosen. They chose to uh, hide the information, kill some of the people who knew the truth, and then traverse this disease, this virus, all across the world. We've watched, too, as the Chinese Communist Party has made political decisions in the past year to support the regime in Russia. Vladimir Putin and Xi Jinping together talking about a relationship that will be the most important relationship of this century, and one where they describe themselves as friends for life, kind of like your daughters have BFFs. Um, they are committed to that. That is an anti-Western coalition that the Chinese Communist Party and the Communist Party of Russia have put together. So what should America do? How should it respond? We should have debates like we're having tonight so that you can better, the American people can better understand the challenges. They're not 10 feet tall. The Chinese Communist Party has its own share of troubles inside of their own country. But we should be clear about the things that matter to the United States of America. We, we watched something that had been going on for a decade where they had been holding what amounts to a million and change people in the western parts of China in what for all the world would look like a concentration camp. These are Uyghur people, Muslims, Turkish descent mostly, uh, different ethnicities, but they are attempting to stamp out this entire ethnicity. We decided to declare a genocide in the Trump administration. You should know it was incredibly controversial that we do so. Everyone in this room who had the same set of facts that I had seen would have seen how indecent, how fundamentally tyrannical, and how awful that Chinese Communist Party behavior was and what it meant for the rest of the world if they were prepared to do that to their own people. You know, um, the question of how to respond is one where we have to build out friends and allies all across the world. Uh, we sought to do that. We built out an organization we called the Quad. It was Japan and India and Australia and us. The Biden administration has extended and built on that. I'm very happy and proud to say that the Biden administration has that part right. And then finally, we have to think about what this means for our institutions of learning. They'll talk a great deal tonight about our institutions of higher education, our colleges and universities. You should know that the Chinese Communist Party is active on nearly every campus across America. It is also the case that we have benefited from the research of talented Chinese academics in some of our most important institutions here in America. But make no mistake about it, the Chinese Communist Party is there with a mission, and we have to think about, and tonight they will discuss, how it is an American response, a response that is appropriately American, will be built. It is important also to know that they aren't just in our universities and colleges. They're on our K-12 through campuses all across America, too. I, I told the story in some remarks I gave at the Nixon Library of a Chinese Communist Party official who came to a local school board meeting and showed up with a check for $10,000 for a new playground, a new swing set. It seems implausible to me that they cared about the physical fitness of those young people. They were making friends. They were developing relationships. So when a difficult day comes, when a challenging moment arises, they can have a real impact. You know, we have over a million foreign students, students in our colleges and universities, some 300 plus thousand of them from China. You should know that we have about 11,000 Americans that study in China each year. And so when one thinks about reciprocity and fairness and decency and equivalence, it is worth noting that we not, don't remotely have that today, partly because of the choices American students make. They just don't want to study there but partly because it is not the case that the Chinese Communist Party would ever think to permit American students to operate inside of their most prestigious, important laboratories and universities. It just wouldn't happen. We, um, we've got to get this right. And while I don't want to bias the conversation tonight, we, we know that if we fail at this, at this challenge that in my judgment is the one for our generation and the one behind us, just as our 
parents and me in my youth battled the Soviet ideology. This ideological battle is one that is serious and must be waged, and one that I am very confident, I am very confident that when people like you come out in an evening to hear a scholarly discussion on an important issue, it is one that I am heartened, that I am heartened, I am optimistic. We will prevail, America will get this right, 1.4 billion people inside of China will come to live better lives as a result of America's response to this threat that is presented to us. This isn't just about American kids and grandkids. I want the Chinese people, I want the people of Vietnam and, and Philippines and Singapore and Malaysia and Japan and Australia all to live better lives as well. If we allow the Chinese Communist Party too much free reign, and Xi Jinping in particular to dominate this conversation in a way that is adverse to the ideas we hold most central, then America will look different. It's not gonna happen. President Reagan had the classic line that says, we win, they lose. I believe in this case, this will be where America will win and the Chinese people will win as well. Thank you for giving me the chance to be here tonight. Bless you, good luck. Thanks to the Steamboat Institute and thanks for all you do to support its great work. Good luck and enjoy the conversation. <laughs> Try not to trip. <laughs> All right, let's bring out our debaters and moderator and have them take their seats and then I will introduce them. Welcome. Welcome, gentlemen. All right, arguing the affirmative on tonight's resolution, and, and once again, um, the resolution, let's restate it, do the risks of academic engagement with China outweigh the benefits, and should the US government and universities take action to address this risk? Uh, you can see the current poll results displayed on the screen. Uh, once again, you will have the opportunity to uh, express your opinion again when the uh, debate has concluded. Arguing the affirmative on tonight's resolution is Miles Yu. Dr. Yu is a senior fellow and director of the China Center at the Hudson Institute. He's also a professor of East Asia and military and naval history at the US Naval Academy in Annapolis, Maryland. Dr. Yu specializes in Chinese military and strategic culture, US and Chinese military and diplomatic history, and US policy toward China. Dr. Yu joined the Trump administration and served as the China policy advisor to Secretary Pompeo. In that capacity, he advised the secretary on all China-related issues, helped overhaul U.S. policy toward China, and participated in key U.S. government interagency deliberations on major policy and government actions with regard to China and other East Asian countries, including Japan, South Korea, and Taiwan. He is a visiting fellow at the Hoover Institution as a member of the Military History Contemporary Conflict Working Group. From 2011 to 2016, Dr. Yu wrote the weekly column, Inside China, for the Washington Times. Since 1996, he has been an editorial consultant to Radio Free Asia and a contributor to various media outlets, including the Wall Street Journal and PBS NewsHour. Dr. Yu has published widely on topics in his field, including two books and many scholarly articles on China, military and intelligence history, and newspaper columns about contemporary Chinese political and military affairs. His numerous awards include the U.S. Naval Academy's Top Researcher Award, U.S. Naval Special Action Awards, and the U.S. Navy Meritorious Service Award. Dr. Yu received a doctorate in history from the, from the University of California at Berkeley, a master's degree from Swarthmore College, and a bachelor's degree from Nankai University. Let's welcome Dr. Miles Yu. Oh, not yet, not yet. I'm, I'm gonna introduce each, each of you and then I'll have you, yeah. My, my apologies for not making that clear. Arguing the negative on tonight's resolution is Yaxing Huang. Professor Huang holds the Epic Foundation Professorship of Global Economics and Management at MIT Sloan School of Management. From 2013 to 2017, he served as an associate dean in charge of MIT Sloan's global partnership programs and its action learning initiatives. 
His previous appointments include faculty positions at the University of Michigan and at Harvard Business School. Professor Huang is the author of 11 books in both English and Chinese and of many academic papers. His book, The Rise and Fall of the East, How Exams, Autocracy, Stability, and Technology Brought China Success and Why They Might Lead to Its Decline, was released this past August. Professor Huang has written for the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, Financial Times, Foreign Policy, and Foreign Affairs. He is working on several policy projects related to U.S.-China relations. He was one of the co-authors of MIT's report, University Engagement with China, an MIT Approach, and he is a co-chair of an impl implementation committee on that report. He is a member of a task force at the Asia Society on U.S.-China policy and is a member of Brookings CSIS Advisory Council on Advancing U.S.-China Collaboration. This year, he is a visiting fellow at the Kissinger Institute at the Woodrow Wilson Center in Washington, D.C. Professor Huang has held or received prestigious fellowships such as the National Fellowship at Stanford University and the Social Science Research Council MacArthur Fellowship. The National Asia Research Program named him one of the most outstanding scholars in the U.S., conducting research on issues of policy importance to the United States. He has served as a consultant at World Bank and Asia Development Bank, and he is a founding member and serves as the president of the Asian American Scholar Forum, an NGO dedicated to open science, protection of rights, and well-being of Asian American scholars. Let's say a warm welcome to Professor Huang. And our moderator for this evening's debate is George Bogdan. Mr. Bogdan is an Olin Fellow at Columbia Law School, a senior visiting researcher at Bard College, and former Kennan Fellow at the Kennan Institute. Previously, he served as the German Marshall Fund's Helmut Schmidt Fellow, based in Berlin. Before completing his graduate education, he served as an inaugural senior fellow at the Hungary Foundation in residence in Budapest, as well as the first associate director of the Center for the Future of Liberal Society at the Hudson Institute. Mr. Bogdan's commentary has appeared in the Wall Street Journal, the Marine Corps University Press, and many other publications. Before defending his dissertation, he undertook a Fulbright Fellowship in Kosovo. After earning his BA from Yale, he served as the university's Joseph C. Fox Fellow in Istanbul. He's a Rockefeller Fellow at the Trilateral Commission and a term member of the Council on Foreign Relations. And we are very proud that George Bogdan was awarded with Steamboat Institute's Tony Blankley Fellowship for Public Policy and American Exceptionalism at our 15th Annual Freedom Conference held in Beaver Creek, Colorado this past August. Let's give a warm welcome once again to our speakers and to our moderator, George Bogdan. And now, George, I will let you take it over. Well, good evening, everyone. And uh, thank you, Jennifer, for that wonderful introduction, very warm. Um, we're also indebted, of course, to Secretary Pompeo. I think he set the scene for us this evening to delve very deeply into the resolution before us. Um, I won't repeat that resolution because we've, we've heard it a few times now, but I will uh, remind you if you haven't had a chance to participate in the first of two polls uh, that we'll be taking this evening to make sure that we know whether you agree, disagree, or are undecided on the resolution. However, before we begin, I'd also like to remind you uh, that it's uh, important that you submit questions during the debate. So the QR uh, code that's available is used to submit questions. And those who are watching online and in person will also be able to use the link provided to them by email or by text. I'll receive those questions in real time, and I'll do my best to weave them into the conversation we have here on stage. Our format is straightforward this evening. Professors Yu and Huang will alternate in their presentations of rebuttals for and against uh, the resolution. Those will be five-minute opening statements. Then we'll have 40 minutes of questions in which our two debaters will switch off first and second in answering each of the questions that is posed. And finally, we'll come to a close with concluding remarks from each of our speakers lasting five minutes. Um, with that, I'd like us to get started on what I hope will be a very exciting debate. So Professor Yu, please uh, join us on stage. Thank you. 
Thank you very George. Uh, thank you Jennifer for the generous introduction and uh, thank you Steamboat for hosting us for this very important debate. Um, I, uh, I was told this is a very important issue and I agree so so much so I actually wrote uh, something down and uh, that's a mistake because I read it it's 10 minutes long uh, and I'm not Ben Shapiro I can read that fast. <laughs> So, um, and then uh, George only gave me five minutes. So what I will do is, um, um, actually this is, this is good because I just read uh, a fortune cookie recently. It something goes, something goes something like this. Uh, An immortal speech should never be eternal. So I, I will retreat uh, time. Now uh, I feel a little bit odd to, uh, to actually come here to uh, argue for the resolution because uh, in my mind it's a, it's a settled issue of risks you know, engaging with China obviously um, uh, outweigh uh, the benefits. Um, I think that's basically, you know, more and more people are, were, were coming to that consensus. Uh, if you look at the uh, uh, American business, uh, every major Western company is developing or contemplating to develop an exit strategy from China, at least a plan B, because they consider the, the risk is, is so big. And uh, our Secretary of Commerce, uh, Gina Raimondo, recently said China is uninvestable uh, because risk existed there. Uh, and uh, uh, if you are thinking about um, uh, the uh, tourist, people vote with their feet. I mean, Chinese uh, uh, international uh, tourists to China has, has dropped dramatically. In some major places, down by 90%. Right, so that's basically is a, uh, uh, is is the uh, is a pretty telling um, analysis, and uh, uh, most importantly, if you um, uh, uh, I don't know if I can show this or not. Okay, I have some slides over here. Uh, so if you consider the American educational institution, uh, it's all very imp uh, clear that uh, right now, as we speak. There are 370,000 Chinese student scholars studying in the United States. Does anybody know how many Americans studying in China? 382. 382. That's because the risks far outweigh the benefits. Universities were withdrawing their programs over China. Many Chinese language teaching pro programs were shifting, getting out of China, and many of them shifted to Taiwan. So, uh, so I thought this is kind of a settled issue, but. I think obviously this is a, a, a debate, so I'm going to basically uh, lay out the five reasons why I think this resolution is correct and ask uh, for your vote. First, I think uh, you know, well, if you look at the Chinese system, um, American system, Chinese education system is uh, uh, fundamentally incapable of producing the large quantity of talented students the CCP needs to fulfill its ambitions to modernize its military economy, and tighten its social control over the Chinese people. In doing all that, the Chinese Communist Party hopes it will undermine the global order that Washington has led for decades, creating a new international system with Beijing at the center. In other words, Chinese, China does not have the academic infrastructure to accomplish this within its own higher education system. For decades, the CCP's solution to solve that problem has been to outsource its higher education to the United States to lead the Americans to train for, uh, for, for the Chinese Communist Party. And, and uh, our university have trained the best and brightest for the Chinese Communist Party. Let the numbers uh, tell the story. Over 90% of the students are in STEM fields in the United States. The 370,000 Chinese students and scholars in the United States constituting about 40% of all international students uh, coming from over 180 countries. That's a lot. Nearly 90% of all the Chinese students have returned to China rather than stay in the United States. If you compare India, which also sends a lot of people uh, uh, here to study, the return rate is about 20%. Most of them stay here. If you look at the Silicon Valley, many of the industry leaders are Indian uh, uh, descent. They contribute to American economy, uh, to American uh, system. So, uh, so uh, that's why I think you know, uh, uh, this is a... Uh, a, a not uh, a good system. In second, so this is great for, for Beijing and for the students we educate, but it is not necessarily a national, in the national interest of the United States. Second, uh, engaging with China also undermines American national security and U.S. institution. China is a country that has a very strict exit uh, control. In other words, the government 
selects who gets to go out, who, who, who's not allowed. So as a result, most of the students who are studying in the United States coming from some of the key universities controlled by the Chinese Communist government, mostly from the 39 Project uh, 985 uh, schools and later on the seven military and defense universities. So this poses a serious national security concern all over the world. And uh, once you are here in the United States on American free soil, you are not really out of the arms of the Chinese Communist Party. And they control the student bodies all across America. There are about 150 organizations called the Chinese Student and Scholars Associations. About, uh, uh, it's called the uh, uh, C CSSA. Those were mostly directly controlled by the Chinese uh, consulate uh, 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 and embassies. Now here, you can see, I show you one of them. It's called Southwest Chinese Student Scholars Association. In its charter, it says, we are uh, uh, under the leadership of Chinese consulate. And every official, including the president, elected uh, for that organization has to be approved uh, prior by the US consul uh, by the Chinese consulate in Los Angeles. This is an organization that, that covers tens of thousands of Chinese students in 39 schools in Arizona, Southern California, New Mexico, and Hawaii. And uh, if you look at this, uh, the, the lower uh, right corner of that, that's the contact information. The contact information of this alleged independent Chinese Students uh, Association is the contact information for the Los Angeles Chinese Consulate. Okay, now let me just move on. University of Tennessee, Knoxville, this is another CSSA. This is important because this one state in its charter directly say, we directly report to the Chinese embassy, says there. And our main funding comes from the Chinese government in, in the United States embassy. And also, most importantly, this, this CSS also cover Oak Ridge National Lab, where all Americans' nuke bombs were made. There's a lot of uh, ethnic Chinese, either you are Chinese citizens, Taiwanese or Chinese Americans who, have American, who are American citizens, they are all eligible to join that organization. Right now, that has 500 membership. So you can see, this is a Chinese government extension of Chinese arm of control. So that's very, very important. If you don't believe me, you can basically uh, watch the FBI's uh, 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 crime statistics. There are a lot of indictment and charges over there. So third, thirdly, I think the... Uh, uh, The U.S. higher education uh, is corrupted by Chinese money. Money corrupts Chinese Communist Party money corrupts absolutely. Uh, most American higher education are local uh, and uh, uh, locally run, and uh, they get a lot of money. U.S. Department of Education reported that there are 1.3 billion dollars received by the American universities from the Chinese government are illegally unreported. And in those universities uh, uh, enjoying these financial benefits on behalf of the Chinese government, it is doubtful that they, are, they will take the lead on combating this issue without the involvement of the US government. So uh, fourth, academic engagement with China also corrupts scholarly ethics and the research responsibilities. Opportunity corrupts, and Chinese opportunity corrupts absolutely. We say China is land of opportunity, China is land of, uh, 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 of chances, but also is land of uh, irresponsibility, ethical absence, and moral uh, deprivation in some way. Uh, the Chinese model of research has dangerously corrupted many of our top universities and research institutions. I'll give you two examples very quickly. One is the US government banned the gain of function research in biology. Chinese government allows it. So many biologists, uh, in universities, co collaborate with dangerous gain of function research at the Wuhan Institute of Biology. There are six universities, American universities, including Harvard, University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, University of Alabama, and the University of Texas and Galveston. In addition uh, to that is our National Institute of Health and the Eco, Eco uh, Health Alliance. They have a very close ties with the Wuhan Institute of Biology in the research of some illegal things that would never have been approved by the US government and the regulations. So that's corruption. And as a result, many of the uh, scientists from these universities and institutions took the wrong side in the whole debate on COVID origin, which is, which is basically, in my view, moral corruption of the worst kind. Lastly, uh, I will say, 
Uh, there are some good people from academe who insist that engagement with China is also important. We cannot completely cut off. I agree. But the problem is uh, you really uh, kind of have both ways because Chinese government is a government that re requires unanimity of opinions. You're either with me 100% or no soup for you. Uh, that's the problem. Uh, it's precisely like that, like, this, like the soup Nazi in Seinfeld. Uh, 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 if you don't comply with the totalitarian demand, and that means one thing, no soup for you. So that's the problem. And, and I think if you don't believe me, try to urge your professor, your dean, uh, to say happy birthday to the Dalai Lama. Or you can politely request Chinese government to allow international inquiry into COVID origin, and all your integrity, all your principle will mean nothing because your cooperation with China will end in nanoseconds. So that's the problem we're dealing with. So uh, in conclusion, this is not to say that there are no benefits at all out of academic exchange with China, but the risks to the United States far outweigh those fringe benefits. So I urge you to vote for the proposition that the risks of academic engagement with China outweigh the benefits, and the United States government and the university must take action to address this risk. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Professor Yu. Uh, Professor Zhuang, if you'd like to give us your opening presentation. I <clears throat> answer in the uh, negative on this question, not because I don't recognize the risks of academic uh, educational exchanges with China, but because of three considerations, or at least three considerations that, at least in my mind, and I would argue in the mind of many, many academics in this country, that overwhelmingly favor the case to continue academic and educational exchanges with China. I'll briefly describe these three considerations, and I'll be happy to go into more details during the debate. First, the very nature of science is its openness. Scientists and scholars at large publish. The saying that sometimes you hear, publish or perish, is actually really true. Um, this is the ethos of science, but it is also its necessity. Young scientists publish to get promoted, to get famous among their colleagues. For the established scientists, this is the way they communicate with their peers and colleagues, and because they want to contribute to building an accumulation of knowledge. This is true of the entire academia, which is fundamentally different from the corporate world. The debate today is not about whether Apple or Google or companies like that continue engagement with China, although I'll be happy to come to that question. This is about academia. Academia is about openness. This is true of sciences, but it's also true of social sciences and humanities. Jennifer mentioned that I just published a book it took me 10 years. It would be supremely stupid of me to work on a book for 10 years, writing the book, and then put it under my mattress, under the bed, and use it as a pillow. It's not a good pillow, but I tried. <laughs> Except for very few cases, universities don't conduct classified research. Let me say it again except for extremely few cases, and usually they are separate from the main part of the university, universities don't conduct classified research. We really need to distinguish between academia and the corporate world, and then among academia, we need to distinguish between major research universities and national laboratories. Everything is in the public domain. Everything is in the public domain. This is why the whole premise that there are many, many Chinese spies on campus is just so fundamentally flawed. The word spy, and I make sure that I check the dictionary definition of that, is a person who secretly collects and reports information. He secretly collects information because the information itself 
is secret. But in academia, as I pointed out before, everything is in the public domain, as open as New York Times. Imagine charging a person with espionage crime when he or she collects information from New York Times. Right? So this is the level of the issue we are talking about. Second, we need to continue academic and educational exchanges with China because we need to. It was Milton Friedman who once said, although I can't track down the precise quote, science is done by millions of individuals. Science is a capital-intensive activity. It is also a labor-intensive activity. It requires many, many people, not just professors, but also graduate students, postdocs, research assistants, lab technicians. China today, by far, is the largest foreign country as the source of graduate students in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. The vast majority of Chinese students stay in America if we let them. In 2017, as of 2017, 90% of the Chinese STEM graduates who got their doctorate degrees between 2000 and 2015 were still in the United States. Recent data may have changed, but this is data going back to 2017. We need to continue also because in some areas, we're actually learning from our Chinese scientists and colleagues rather than the other way around. We are actually the beneficiary of the exchange rather than being the sole contributors to those exchanges. We also need to continue because academic and educational exchanges are one of the few ways that are left that our two peoples can work together on common problems and enhance mutual understanding. And this is especially precious and important at this moment of geopolitical tensions and para. Scientific collaboration is especially valuable because scientists speak the same language. Yes, we need to confront China with issues and human rights, geopolitics, and national security in values and ideologies, but wouldn't it be, wouldn't be a better approach to work on these differences by starting from something that the two sides have in common in the first place. Last but not the least, I and many of my colleagues, not just at MIT, but across academia, fully recognize that there are risks, especially in this age of accelerated pace of applying knowledge to industry, to military applications, and the increasingly dual nature use of technology and science. But I would argue that the right approach is to de-risk the collaborations rather than decoupling the collaborations with China. In this regard, as Jennifer mentioned, my own university, MIT, has led the way under our associate provost, Richard Lester, a group of faculty wrote a report, it's online, I, I'll be happy to, uh, to send it to you, a report that proposed principles and guidelines for engaging with China. I was in that group, I was one of the co-authors, and I believe that this is the right approach. I actually agree with the second half of the proposition, the need to address risks. But there are risks everywhere. There are risks of car accidents. But the right approach is not to give up driving, but to devise ways to safeguard safety and devise ways to address and ameliorate those risks. I personally do not see the world in black and white colors and uh, with moralistic certitude. I believe that attitude should apply to our approach to China in foreign policy, but also to research and education. 
we have to compromise and devise guardrails rather than creating categorical bans, especially by the federal government, or having the government intervene and make detailed decisions in issues related to research and education where academics should have the first of the say over these matters. There are people in Congress who are calling for legislating these matters, and I believe that's not the right approach. The, approach. the right approach should be that the universities deal with this, and the universities working with the federal agencies to deal with these risks. Thank you. I look forward to our discussion. Thank you, Professor Huang. Um, Professor Yu, would you like to make your rebuttal at this time? Yeah. Just three minutes? So go over there. Whichever you like. OK, so uh, um, there's more conversation right this way. Oh, thank you very much, Professor Huang, for providing this, uh, this, uh, this uh, salient point. Uh, yes, science should be open. Yes, uh, scholarship should not be uh, uh, within the borders. Uh, but it's all principle. Uh, when you talk about China, China is a totally different animal. Uh, you mentioned about uh, uh, different uh, attitude, uh, moral uh, certitude. Uh, that's what the Trump administration was accused of. But uh, that's not entirely uh, accurate. All we did was to give the Chinese Communist Party the agency. In the past, there is a problem between China and the United States. We always criticize ourselves. We always should, uh, should uh, uh, examine ourselves, should we raise the, uh, the temperature, or should we just be less hawkish, as if what we do would matter. No, the fundamental factor deciding the nature, direction, and, uh, and the healthiness uh, of the U.S.-China relationship is China. So uh, just, just think about the points that you, you list over there. Uh, you say uh, uh, science should not be without border. China uh, is not uh, a country that is uh, all for openness. China set up barriers. The entire country has a different internal domain. It's a great firewall. So that's not good for openness. Uh, just keep that number in mind. 370,000 Chinese students studying here enjoy our freedom. Only 382 Americans study in China. It's because China's espionage law, their counterintelligence law, make every foreigner virtually a suspect of the state, of being a spy. So uh, there is, yes, there is also law, and, uh, law enforcement uh, uh, urgency here in this country, catching spies. That's what FBI does, right? But you go to China, the whole nation is, is about catching foreign spies. Every foreigner is naturally, uh, by default, is some kind of suspect. That is a spy culture we have to talk about. Now, coming about spy, I think you're absolutely right. I don't think Chinese uh, um, uh, spies really uh, steal the uh, secrets of this country furtively as, as much as nearly as they do on cyber spy. Cyber espionage is much, much more serious right now. In most cases, if you look at the FBI's multiple charges against Chinese nationals, they are mostly about two things. One is illegal, unlawful uh, uh, lack of disclosure of their funding. Secondly, it's really about the infringement of American intellectual property rights, trade secrets. Those were not traditional spy. Those were basically a violation of intellectual property rights. And China is a country that does not encourage that kind of stuff. I'll tell you, in the first week of the outbreak of the COVID in, in Wuhan, <clears throat> there is an American uh, pharmaceutical company which developed a very effective uh, uh, medicine. I forget the name of it. Uh, it's called the Gillette, which is based in, uh, in Foster City, California. They gave 30 doses of that, uh, 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 that medicine for compassion use for the Wuhan uh, patients over there. This company, American company, spent millions of dollars developing this. And the moment that medicine, compassion dose donation, reached Wuhan Institute of Virology, the next day, that institute fired for patent for that product. That's the country we're dealing with. So openness, you know, uh, without border, uh, uh, principal engagement, it's all right. But you cannot have one hand clapping and produce some kind of sound. Take two to tangle. So, I, so that's why we have to really make China be responsible for its own, uh, for its own action. Uh, 
so that's why I, I think, you know, uh, 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 we have to do two things. One, we have to realize the, uh, the risk, as Professor Huang and I will share, but we have to deal with the issue practically, pragmatically, concretely. We cannot just talk about principles. As I say, if the, prof if the president of MIT sent a tweet saying happy birthday to Dalai Lama, your entire program between MIT and Chinese uh, uh, university will be over next day. So that's the kind of uh, uh, the moral uh, certitude and uh, you know, um, uh, the, uh, the, the absoluteness that we're talking about right now. Thank you, Professor Yu. Professor Wang, would you like to remind uh, Thank you, Miles. Uh, I truly enjoy uh, our uh, conversation and exchange of ideas. I, I think the uh, criticizing China for closing its own border, that's a very fair criticism. And if there was a debate in Dali and China rather than Dallas of the United States, I would make the same argument for openness, for continuing academic and educational exchanges with the United States. Whether or not I survive that, that's a separate issue. <laughs> uh, but, but let me just, uh, I, I think the argument goes both ways. And secondly, I wouldn't want the United States, our adopted country, to emulate the mistakes that China has made. Right? So they have created this kind of a spy network and, and, and all of that. I think that's, we don't want to make our own country into that. That's a country you want to stay away from rather than uh, emulate. And I, I don't believe it's shooting themselves in the feet by closing academic and commercial exchanges with the West. Right? If you look at the, on the commercial side, foreign direct investment is now going to China. Entrepreneurs are leaving China. Right? By closing the borders, by closing these uh, exchanges, the country is paying a huge price for it. I believe that we would pay a price for it as well if we adopt that approach. Secondly, or maybe thirdly, the disclosure issue is actually very complicated. Um, it, it is not a very straightforward issue. The federal agencies have, different federal agencies have different disclosure rules, and sometimes they are not consistent with each other. Before the China initiative, and that came, I think, into effect in 2018, that wasn't viewed as an issue, but because of the uh, attention, to, policy attention to this matter, all these things started becoming more important. But the problem is that the US government was holding the primarily Chinese American scientists for a standard that was in and of itself not clear and straightforward. Let me just give an example of my colleague Gang Chen, a distinguished, brilliant scientist who has made huge contributions to science and engineering. Uh, the, he was arrested, and one of the charges was wire fraud for failure to disclose. Let me just illustrate how complicated the issue is. You know, he applied for a Department of Energy loan, uh, not loan, grant, and it required him to uh, disclose. And one of the things that the, uh, the Justice Department charged him with was that he hid information about a collaboration agreement with a Chinese university. Right? And he didn't disclose that on the form. In fact, the whole collaboration agreement was disclosed on the website of the MIT. And Professor Chen was acting as a officer, as a representative of MIT, negotiating with the Chinese university, rather than on his own behalf. And typically, these disclosures will give you, you know, they will tell you to disclose five and six and maybe 10 activities. Professor Chen has a CV that is 135 pages long, right? And so you can always find information that he didn't disclose. 
And by the way, it was remarkable. The outcome of the whole case was remarkable. The government, to the credit of the Justice Department, dropped every single charge against Professor Chen because they simply didn't have a case for it. The conviction rate of the Chinese American scientists being charged with wire fraud and, and, and others is incredibly low, incredibly low. In one case that we know of, the FBI agent who investigated a Chinese American professor didn't speak a single word of Chinese, and he used Google Translate to translate some Chinese website. And on the basis of that information, he suspected that the professor had connections with Chinese university. It went to the trial, and the uh, outcome of the trial was that the professor was uh, cleared of these charges. So in the end, many of these charges didn't succeed. Many of the Chinese American professors who were uh, arrested, who were uh, charged, many of them didn't even go to the court. The ones that did go to the court uh, did not succeed in terms of uh, conviction. So in, in terms of IPR, that's uh, intellectual property rights, that's a very complicated issue. But let me just say that the universities are not, the main purpose of the university is not to create intellectual property rights. That may be the result of it. The main purpose of the university is to create knowledge and put that knowledge in the public domain. Intellectual property rights is about private property right over an intellectual asset. Many universities have patent offices, IP offices, but that's not really the main purpose of a university. And the example that Mayo cited, they all have to do with you know, Chinese research institutions or commercial activities rather than universities here. Well, thank you so much. I think we should move on now to questions. And I want to com combine a few that we've gotten from our audience. And um, there seems to be quite a bit of interest in whether there's a risk to the CCP uh, when it comes to exposure of the American system uh, to Chinese students. And I wonder how you think that that will play out, or is that an illusion? Famously, Xi Jinping spent time in the Midwest, and now he heads the, the system. And so how do you feel about that issue? Uh, before I, uh, uh, I go on, I just want to respond to what Professor Huang said. Uh, the China Initiative, uh, initiative uh, there were 77 cases altogether. Yeah. PRC nationals consider about 15 of them. Okay? So the idea that the prevailing against discrimination against the PRC national uh, uh, statistics doesn't support that. Right? So the convictions, uh, uh, there are uh, several cases were thrown out. And there are some convictions going on there, guilty pleas as well. So that's what American court system is all about. FBI is not a police uh, uh, organization. It's a law and, law and order and a law enforcement organization. They charge somebody, arrest somebody, go to the court, and the court throw out and convict them. So that's a normal process. So people always say there is a, there is a persistent idea, there's an Asia hate. Um, they're all, you, cannot, you cannot eliminate the ignorance and the stupidity in any country. There are people who are ignorant, there are biases over there, but overwhelmingly, this country is the most welcoming country to all immigrants, Asian, African, European, or anybody else. So, so that's why I'm saying, you know, um, I don't think there's Asian hate. On the contrary, there's Asian love, if anything. Back to the question. So, so, but can I, can okay, I, great. Yeah, yeah. Can I just respond to that? Um, you, you, you specifically said PRC citizens. Uh, uh, as far as I know, my colleague, uh, Professor Chen, uh, is a naturalized American citizen. 90% of the cases fell on Chinese Americans, right? And some of them are, you know, I, I didn't know that they were PRC citizens, but I thought all of them were uh, naturalized uh, uh, American citizens. and. You're right that there is a, you know, in the end, Professor Chen was cleared. But the power to charge 
is a incredible power that the Chinese uh, that the government has, American government has. It shouldn't be used cavalierly to use Google Translate as the empirical basis to formulate a case against a distinguished professor. And in the end, the case fell apart. I will consider that as a cavalier use of that power, right? Even though in the end, the case was cleared, but the professor lost his job temporarily. Professor Chen couldn't continue his research. He couldn't interact with his students. His lab was uh, dissolved. He couldn't receive funding. He lost productivity, right? These are real, and, and at the human level, these are real, real costs, right? So I wouldn't say that simply because you have a justice system that in the end that delivered, I wouldn't excuse the government for using its power to charge, which is a tremendous power in the way that at least I have seen. He, yes, was I, sus he was suspected of, of wrongdoing. He was not convicted. The conviction comes from the court. I'm glad that his, this case was thrown out. But you know, FBI is, is doing its legal duty to enforce its law. So they arrest this person, and then evidence may be not lacking, but you have to, it's up to the court to say, I, I, I don't think there is an excess of use of federal power in this case. Yes, for one acquittal, there are two or three, four uh, guilty plea, uh, guilty convictions. So that's why I'm saying this is what legal system is all about. Everybody who is involved in a lawsuit knows the cost of lawsuit. Professor, no, but, you, but, let's, but, let's move on maybe to a broader point because I think the audience is really concerned about this question of the human level and the question of cultural exchange and whether there is an impact that is taking place uh, for those Chinese students that come to the United States that, that is relevant to the debate. Is that a benefit we should be weighing in the scale of the risks versus the benefits? I think the most overwhelming majority of the students come from China, uh, innocent, aspirant, uh, working hard to get a good life, in, uh, you know, get good education, there's no question about that. Um, I have many friends, most of my friends are Chinese, actually. So uh, uh, on the other hand, we should not downplay the role the state actor play. China is not Switzerland. China is not Canada. China is aiming to get Americans high tech, our crown jewel of intellectual properties, pure and simple. This is established uh, by their own documents, by their own statement of, of missions. So. Uh, it's all nice to talk about the, the principles, the niceties of cultural exchange, but we have to really deal with the real issue. To talk about human cost. Uh, the Chinese government's long arm of control has caused a serious problem to this country. There was a student from University of Maryland, a Chinese uh, female student, who gra upon graduation, she made a, uh, a, a speech uh, to the audience at University of Maryland College Park. She admired the fresh air, the freedom in America for that. He was, she was the victim of the mob smear campaign on campus organized by the Chinese consulate. At Princeton, there was a political science class. We're talking about China. The students are so afraid, so afraid, they have to cover their faces in, in order not to be identified, right? And you, uh, you got the, uh, 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 I myself became a victim of that kind of a smear campaign. Several months ago, I was invited to give a talk uh, for a conference at the University of Seattle in Washington, uh, University of Washington in Seattle, rather, and uh, organized by the library over there. And the, uh, because I'm sanctioned by the Chinese government, so the Chinese professors, those were American citizens of Chinese descent, they were very pro-China. They launched a smear campaign, put a lot of pressure on the organizer on campus. So that conference has to be canceled and moved to Las Vegas because of me. Okay. Well, and that's, Wong, that's human cost. Would you like to give us a counterpoint to some of those evaluations of that question about exposure and what value it might have? Yeah, so, so, so before we get there, I, I do want to come back because this is a really important point. Uh, Miles said that this is a rule of law country. Part of, I'm not a lawyer, you are, George. Uh, part of the rule of law is about 
deliberations in the court system. But part of it is norms and the judgment that you do not apply the power without due respect and process for basic facts. In the case of Professor Chen, there were basic factual errors in the charging document that a easy Google search would have corrected, right? So they are, we're not talking about very complex legal issues and doctrines about you know, jurisdiction. You know, again, I'm not a lawyer, so I'm trying to use these terms to sound more impressive than, than, than I am. But it is, it, is, it, is, it is remarkable how basic the factual errors were. And, and the government, in the end, dropped the case, right? Uh, you know, recognizing that those uh, mistakes. On the question that you posed, there's pretty good body of research that shows that the Chinese students who are educated in America are more liberal, are more tolerant, are more, um, are more democratic, if you want to put it that way, than their counterparts in China, right? Controlling for age and gender and, and, and all of that. I do believe in the liberalizing effect of Western education and its influence on the young people from, from China. And, you know, Miles is right. China, you know, I just wrote a book about this. China has thousands of years of autocracy. And it is a very watertight system. There are not many levers to influence the political development of that country. In my opening remarks, that was one of the arguments I used, right? Scientific exchange, educational exchange, cultural exchange, and academic exchange. These are the few ways that we have to engage with Chinese academics, Chinese students, and even Chinese officials. I guess I end up on a view of China that is directionally similar as a Miles view, but there are some differences. I don't view China today as a monolithic society the way that it was during the Cultural Revolution. I view the country as considerably moving back from what it was, and I think Miles and I agree on, on, on that. I'm not happy with that development. But I don't think it has gone all the way back. There are ways that we could influence, maybe on the side, on the margin, the development of the society, the economy. I still believe in commercial engagements, in private sector development, in globalization. Not because I believe that they produce a dramatic effect, but these are the few things that we have, yeah, yeah. right? And China is a huge geopolitical power, right? Taiwan, South China Sea. I just think that we shouldn't cut off all the connections and exchanges with that country. The stake is too high. Yeah, Professor, uh, you, I have another question that I think is really important, and that's uh, surrounding the concept of disengagement. Because under the Trump administration, there was an ending, for example, of the Fulbright program to China. And in the absence of that program, there was a, a rise in similar funding from the Chinese state for American scholars to come to China, but there were a greater number of restrictions on what could be studied. And so many of the people in the audience seem concerned that by disengaging, we let go of the capacity to set the terms of exchange. And how do you think that that set of dynamics plays out? Should we be engaging more to have more control? Or how, how do you see those yeah. at issues? Uh, well, first of all, I, I think I don't got to get the wrong idea <laughs> over here. Uh, I'm not advocating for total cutoff. I'm not advocating for, for disengagement. There is a, I'm talking about the, the risks outweigh the benefits. There are benefits. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, you mentioned about the, you know, uh, uh, Xi Jinping spent some time in Iowa. I don't think he learned anything. Uh, um, and, you know, Kim Jong-un was educated in Switzerland. I mean, the, the Syrian dictator Bashar al-Assad was educated as a dentist in England. I mean, it's a system. It's a, it's a political system. When, when you were in there, you were going to carry out uh, the, this, this, this situation. So, um, you asked me about 
Uh, it's also uh, uh, not really entirely clear that we end the football program. Many things, China, by the way, never bans Google, never bans Facebook, never bans Twitter. It's Chinese government set a condition to make this company impossible to operate in China. So they, you have to submit your code, you, submit your, you, have to, you have to comply with Chinese intelligence uh, organizations, intellectual property, intellectual property submission. That's how it does. So the Fulbright uh, program is such that we, we believe that it was impossible to continue because that will hurt, destroy the integrity of the program. Like in many programs, we have the same problem with the Peace Corps, right? So it's not correct to say the Trump administration ended, did this terrible thing, we want, we want to end everything. It's just we have this national consensus. By the way, it's not just Republican. Democrats are all, that, all there with us. I was in Pompeo's office. We don't get any complaint from Democrats about our China policy. On the contrary, I got phone calls from the staff of Pelosi and Schumer a couple of times. They complained that our China policy was not tough enough. I said, hello. So this is really, really interesting. So there is a broad, uh, broad uh, consensus uh, on the national level. So I think you know, uh, many of them were disenchanted by the, what's going on in the Congress today uh, with the ouster of the speaker. Uh, but I can tell you, on China, the Congress is united. Every single, every single China-related uh, legislation in the last six years has passed with 80% of them were unanimous. No single dissenting vote. Two of them, three of them were properties with one vote of somebody from Texas just being cranky. So, uh, uh, so that's why, that's why it's, uh, there's a, so it's not just Democrats, Republican issue. China is American issue, and I wish you to address it as a nation. By the way, Con the stake is so high, we really have to engage China to not to end any programs, but to, to use our ex limited exchange with China to create a much better condition. You're absolutely right, Professor Huang, that uh, we really should, the government it really has exercised totalitarian control, but there's not good people at local level, universal level. Those are the, the forces we should uh, utilize. I just don't know how we can do that right now with this kind of increasingly uh, increasingly awarely in control. I mean, seriously, and every scholar, uh, uh, I was in, I was, just one more thing. I was in, uh, just tell you this kind of fear, the, 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 I, I was in Budapest uh, last week for a conference. And in, in, a, uh, uh, in, a, in the morning, one morning, I went to, to, uh, for breakfast about 7.30 in the morning. And then in front of me is a couple from Shanghai, they're university professors. They turn around and recognize me because of my notoriety. So they say, ah, Professor you, we love you, we'll take, a, take, a, take a selfie. At this point, the waitress signal, she thought we were together, so signals would go into the, into, into, the, into the dining hall. The moment we all went in, that couple became frozen. They were so afraid. They didn't want to do anything to me, and I realized they came with a delegation. There are a lot of fellow Chinese certainly over there. They don't want to be associated with me. That's the degree of fear every citizen is facing. In countries like Hungary, right? Imagine that. So that's why I think you know, uh, we have to address the practicality of programs. Principles, integrity, you know, um, uh, uh, disenchantment against the federal government agencies, uh, it's all right. You have a normal channel to do that, but please tell me how to do this. President Juan. So, so I, I just want to make sure that Today's debate is not about how bad China is, right? That's a... That's right. That, yeah, so the country has gone in that direction. That's why we're having this debate. And so we should stay on that topic. We collaborated with Soviet Union. And we actually signed agreements with Soviet universities to work together on some of the really important scientific issues back in the 1960s. Soviet Union, you know, no matter what your opinion of China today is, I don't think China poses the kind of threat that once Soviet Union did to the United States. That was during the Cold War. And there's no evidence that I know of that the collaborations with Soviet Union on science did any damage to America and, uh, and to American interests, right? In fact, to the extent there's any evidence, there was a study 
uh, uh, led by a MIT economist that shows that the collaborations produce a lot of benefits for the United States. Let's think about this issue, right? How do we not collaborate with China on issues of climate, on issues of public health, on issues of sustainability, on issues of energy, all these issues, right? In 2020, uh, a Chinese scientist posted the COVID-19 uh, genome on the international database, right? That was a form of collaboration. And Moderna and other Western companies got the data and they quickly began to develop their vaccine. I fear, I fear, next time there's another pandemic, we won't be able to get that level of collaboration. If we don't fix this issue, if we, you know, I know Miles is not in favor of categorical bans, but listen to the members of the Congress. Listen to the argument that some of them have made. In fact, when Miles said that there is a bipartisan agreement on China, that makes me scared. That makes me really, really scared. That means that there's a lack of nuance. There's a lack of appreciation for the complexities involved. On top of that, you add academia, you add universities, which, by the way, not many people actually understand how academia actually works, right? This whole idea that we put out the knowledge right out there in the open for everybody with a computer to see, right? Not many people understands, understand that point, right? So when you don't have this layered understanding of the country, you don't have the layered understanding of the nature of academic enterprise, and then you devise policies on that basis, I, I would worry. Right. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, it's about time for us to move to our concluding statements. But before I invite Professor Yu up to the uh, podium, or if you'd like to stay. Yeah, I, I, think, I think Professor Huang makes some good point. That I agree with him in, in this kind of general sentiment. Uh, uh, if you want to say, you know, well, the Soviet Union and, and the United States the science uh, cooperation is very limited during the Cold War. The fundamental difference between Soviet challenge and China challenge is that in the, so in the Cold War, uh, Soviet Union and the United States operated on completely different blocks. There was the Warsaw block, and the, the Soviet Union was never part of the international free trade system. China is. So China's influence footprint in the West is much more extensive. That's what makes the, the threat so much more formidable. And that's why when we talk about China threat, it's not 5,000 miles away from Beijing. It's right here on my iPhone. Every tweet I send, I have to consider, you know, somebody, uh, what consequences to me, right? So that's why it's very important. And that's why we, as a responsible member of this country, so every citizen should be worried about China's intention. And you have this many people, 40% of your international student body are from one single country, guided by one state policy, you gotta be worried. So it's not being responsible. I am all for nuances, but I'm saying nuances must have a right policy to guide. Uh, so there's a big picture, there's a small picture. Yes, there, there, there are some people caught in between. Uh, so, uh, so I think that's why uh, we have to look at this from policy point of view. Uh, I'm not worried about national consensus at all. That means the, the divided uh, 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 republic is convinced by irreputable evidence. That's why they reach consensus. Their partisan rancor is so deep, they don't even shake hands with each other. But the evidence against this country is so strong, that's why they acted together. They transcend the trivialities. That's what a Republican uh, citizen is, is all about. So that's why I'm very proud of this country. I don't think you know uh, what Congress consists on China worries me at all. That means the great weakening. I think it's good for the country, good for democracy, good for the future of the world. Professor Huang, just before you begin, you'll have the final word. I just want to remind everyone, please uh, offer us your vote on agree, disagree, or undecided on the resolution so we can compare before the end. But please, last word. I am proud of this country as well, and I'm proud of it precisely because of its openness, its willingness to take immigrants such as Miles and myself 
into this country, and I do hope that the politicians of this country would pursue the kind of policies that would welcome more immigrants to come to this country, and the Chinese students that have been trained and educated in the United States, then they can stay and work in this country. Easily get a green card or H-1B and things like that, right? And this is precisely what we celebrate about this country. We can have this debate without fearing for our safety, and that's tremendous. What I don't want to see is that we adopt the China model, which is closing the debates, closing the exchanges, closing the academic、uh, educational exchanges. And on this issue of academic collaboration, let me just say that there has been long-standing consensus among the policymakers who are in charge of this issue to distinguish between fundamental research and technology, and distinguish between open research and classified research. The document is.、Um, Uh, NSDD 189, that was devised, that was、uh, written by the Reagan administration in 1985, reaffirmed twice, once in 2001 and once in 2010, that argues that the open research should be open, fundamentally open, but we should also put some restrictions on classified research. As recently as 2019. Uh, National Science Foundation charged a report. It's called the Jason Report, that reaffirms the principles and the approach of that was outlined in the NSD 189. Right? We actually have an existing toolkit. We need to improve on it. We need to change here and there. No question about it. We do have the existing toolkit to deal with these issues. I believe that's the way to go. The way to do it is to address risks rather than shy away from collaborations. There will be mistakes, there will be leakages, but I think, given the big picture at stake, given the openness of our academia, given the spirit of science and、uh, science and education, openness, right? So that's the key democratic principle. Those mistakes. May not, and I believe firmly, they do not outweigh the tendency on the part of our society toward openness. All right. Well, thank you, professors, so much. Those were extremely stimulating remarks. I think it's time now to see the、uh, outcomes of our debate this evening. So,、um, at the beginning of the debate, let's let's wait for the results to come up. All right. So at the beginning of the debate,、um, 54 were in favor, 35 were opposed, and 12 were undecided. And now, after the debate, where do we stand? <laughs> Tabulation. Oh. Okay. All right. Well, 73 are in favor, 10 percent are opposed, and 17 percent are undecided. So. Some dynamic changes took place.、Uh, it's been a real pleasure to moderate this debate this evening. I hope you've learned as much as I have. I really did from the marvelous remarks from both of our speakers,、um, and I have to thank the Steamboat, Institu Steamboat Institute again for this this great opportunity.、Uh, let's give us all a round of applause.、Um, <laughs> I'd like to say thank you to our panelists for this great discussion. Thank you to the Adolf Kurz Foundation and the Sumners Foundation for their support of Steamboat Institute's Campus Liberty Tour. 
If you enjoyed this evening's debate, we ask that you consider making your contribution to the Steamboat Institute to allow us to host more debates, um, not only here in, in places like the, the beautiful old Parkland Debate Chamber, but on college campuses all over the country. You can visit steamboatinstitute.org to view our upcoming debates. We have five more in the next five weeks. If you can't join us in person, remember you can always join us virtually. You can host a watch party on your campus or in your community for any of our upcoming debates and participate uh, live from wherever you are in the country. So please visit steamboatinstitute.org and, and support these important programs with your tax-deductible contribution. Tonight's debate will be posted in its entirety on Steamboat Institute's YouTube channel. I encourage you to uh, go to our YouTube channel. We have hundreds of videos on a variety of topics that are a great resource. Um, thank you to Harlan Crow for allowing us to use the beautiful old Parkland debate chamber and for the staff here for being so gracious and welcoming. Thank you all for coming and have a good evening.